Uh, yep, uh, I get the uh, privilege of talking to you all uh, this evening in the UK or, or, or perhaps morning over in the US where many of our colleagues are uh, about our unique approach to uh, uh, line array deployment uh, and our optimized line array technology, which is deployed in our O-line uh, small installation compact line array throughout our Wavefront Precision series and of course most famously in MLA. So what we are trying to do here is to get the most accurate and consistent coverage that we possibly can out of a line array hang. Uh, and we do this uh, by having three different SBIL profile controls. Uh, those are, the first is leakage. So uh, we basically don't want sounds to go outside of the audience area. Uh, smoothness of coverage within the audience area. So uh, effectively having the same sound everywhere that the audience is. And then probably most famously our hard avoid technology, which allows a user to define an area where the sound really must not go. And then one of the very unique things to Martin is our ability to set these three goals independently of each other and have the sound system perform them all at the same time. So that's our multiple goal setting. Uh, the basic principle of what we are trying to do is to use a computer to do uh, number crunching maths, to do optimization using mathematical optimization techniques and remove the trial and error element of setting up a sound system so that really uh, you guys out there deploying PA and installs and in uh, live events, once we have these things back in our world, uh, really are able to get very consistent results and really focus on the creative side of the production. So where does it start? It starts in a different place for Martin Audio than it does for everybody else. What most manufacturers do with a conventional sound system, a conventional line array, is that they'll design a line array module to have you know, good horizontal dispersion and a nice flat planar-ish wavefront uh, uh, vertically. And then they'll work with some software to model the interaction between of those cabinets and think about the shape of the wavefront uh, which is generated by a hang. At Martin Audio, uh, Ambrose and the guys and Jason 10 years ago when we started looking at the principles of optimization, realized quite early on that, that actually we didn't think that was the right way to do it. Because actually, whilst yes, you have a shape of a wave front that comes out of an MLA system, really we don't care about that. What we care about is the frequency response and level that arrives at every single member of the audience. And so well, we set about devising this optimization technique uh, and we'll talk a little bit now about how it works. Okay, so very simple. Here's a 2D slice uh, of a venue. You can see lots of little dots uh, in three different colors. So firstly, every one of those dots represents a virtual measurement microphone. So when uh, the optimization processes begin, uh, they will analyze the frequency response uh, of every cabinet, every single uh, uh, measurement mic point, virtual point, and the way that they interact uh, with the neighbor that is next to them in the hang. And so, in effect, we, knowing all that information, we can then use optimization to get the best result that we need. And we do that across our three predefined goals, the green area, where you can see the audience, the red area, which is non-leakage, so places that we would rather the sound did not go, uh, and then our hard avoid area, which is certainly inside, is typically on the stage or sometimes the roof, where we categorically don't want sound to go. Okay, another very simple concept to understand uh, is we bought uh, uh, the principle of applying these techniques into passive line arrays uh, with FIR filters uh, in electronics uh, into our portfolio in about 2017. And we did that through this very easy to understand concept uh, called scalable resolution, which basically denotes how many of those icon amplifiers uh, display has to play with when it's optimizing a sound system to then be controlled by ViewNet. So very simply put, very easy concept to understand. Four box resolution, which you can see over there on the left-hand side of the screen. Well, that means that I've got one amplifier and one DSP circuit for four enclosures. Uh, and then in the middle, you can see two box resolution, which would be the most equivalent to uh, uh, how people are used to wiring up line array modules. 
And then lastly, our one box resolution where there is a discrete DSP and amplifier channel available for every enclosure in the hang. And a very simple way of thinking about this is if I had a 16 deep hang of WPM, our small six and a half inch line array uh, in a theater with 16 rows of uh, socially distanced seating spaced out, uh, if I have four box resolution, then I am busy uh, processing four rows of seats because each speaker cabinet's pointing at one of those rows of seats and I'm doing that as one block. So, you know, across I'll be processing four, then eight, then 12 and then 16 uh, up the hang. Another way of uh, uh, the other extreme, if you like, or another way of looking at it is at one box resolution, I would be processing each cabinet individually. Each cabinet would be pointing at a row of seats and therefore display would have the freedom to correct the sound to be the same in every single row of seats in the house. What does that mean in terms of frequency response? Well, let's start by looking at just a standard line array. So if you were to take a standard line array without any optimization techniques applied, this is the kind of thing you might expect. Uh, in this case, we've used our WPM hang and we've put a hang of eight in a, in a room that's uh, about 40 meters deep. And effectively what you can see is you can see the red, which represents the frequency response in the front row, the yellow, which represents the mix position, the blue, the green, which is the back of the auditorium, and then finally the blue, which is the rejection either behind or below the loudspeakers. So the first and most clear thing to everybody is, you know, as line arrays came into our lives about 15 years ago, uh, we all believed that they were such an improvement over the sound and the drop off that you got with a standard virtual point source cluster in those days that you know really they were the answer to everything and the sound was going to be the same everywhere you can clearly see that actually that's not the case and so in this instance you know you've got a load of low mid down at the front uh, uh, where there's all that power that's going to struggle to throw to the back of the room without tailing off uh, uh, you know, perhaps opposite to that, you've got all of these HF devices at the top of the hang coupling up and sending the top end right to the back of the room. And what all of that means is the, the guy at the mix position in the yellow frequency response, he's not actually having a representative sound that's mean of the room. So when he's making changes at front of house, it obviously is not going to necessarily sound the same at other points in the room. And then finally, you can see as most people who use line arrays regularly, you could see the blue was pretty poor. Now, as we begin to optimize, and this is four box resolution. So I've now only got two channels of DSP uh, and some FIR filters and my mechanical optimization working away um, to process. And you can immediately see firstly, that behind the speaker, we've begun to get control over the rear rejection and the sound coming out of the bottom of the array. In terms of the frequency response, it's a little bit more consistent. This is a relative frequency response. So it, what we would basically do with optimization is we would flatten the PA and then afterwards you add on a voicing curve to get the uh, desired musical response that you want. So we're looking for these to converge on roughly a flat line. If we move up a little bit into two box resolution, you can immediately see that we've begun to get a little bit more control over the low mid. We typically set the sounds to drop off by 3 dB as you move back in the audience space. And we do that because it gives a little bit more of a natural uh, response for the loudspeaker system. And you can see that's beginning to happen here. You know, we're still a little bit louder at the front, but as we go back, it's beginning to drop off and it's doing it in a uniform manner. And similarly, we've got another step down in the level underneath and behind the loudspeaker. And then finally, if we go to one box resolution, We've got a pretty uniform drop off now. Uh, basically, the relative flat responses are kind of the same at the front, the middle and the back of the room. And now we've got rejection below the hang of maybe up to 30 dB. And, you know, obviously, if this was a small theater, that 30 dB of rejection is 30 dB louder in the house before game before feedback kicks in. So, you know, it's going to be much lower distortion because the PA is not listening to itself for a bunch of microphones. It's going to help with game before feedback and it's going to give a much cleaner audience response. And of course, at this point, the engineer is pretty darn comfortable that whatever he is doing at front of house is being evenly replicated across the audience space. Okay, in terms of commercial advantages of this kind of solution, uh, I guess uh, the most obvious statement is you don't always use the same number of amplifiers depending on the application and amplifiers cost money. 
So you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, in a budget limited uh, rave for a production house, you know, maybe going to one box resolution isn't practical for the customers and those spare amplifiers can be used to uh, power monitor wedges because we can use icon amplifiers with everything we make, you know, or perhaps a corporate gig where they are very concerned about uh, intelligibility of speech across a, a big auditorium uh, and really one box resolution is going to guarantee that and therefore the client can pay a little bit money for it. So on the production side it means that we can vary depending on the result the client needs, depending on what the loudspeaker is actually doing, we can vary the amount of electronics that are required. The example I like to give on the installation side is much more about continuing a, a permanent relationship with the client. So, you know, typically sound systems in the install market are often under pressure for price. So we might be able to go in, install a WPM system at uh, uh, four box resolution. So with a couple of amplifiers processing the system, you can do, you know, even at that level, you can do kind of 32 amps or 32 speakers off an amp. So, you know, really, really cost effective. And then what we would do is encourage that, you know, every year, the clients making an incremental improvement that the cabling was put in for the beginning. And so instead of the sound system being an initial upfront heavy cost that then just deteriorates over the time, we're able to go back with a long term plan to continuously improve the performance of the sound system over the coming months or years. So in terms of how it all works, it's pretty easy really. There's four quick steps. Uh, you go into display two, you draw a quick slice, a uh, vertical slice of the room and you drop your speakers in. After that, you define your audience areas. So where there's an audience, where you want the hard avoid and where you want no leakage. And then you move on to the next step, which is the first level of optimization. What now happens is based on the height that you've put the hang and the, the requirements that you've put on the sound system, a mathematical process will run and it will go through every single combination of angles that is possible for that loudspeaker hang, uh, uh, not as a geometric model, but as a full acoustic model. And it will come out and say, okay, with no processing whatsoever, the best result I can give you is this. And then we move on to optimize from a DSP perspective. So first thing we need to do is we need to tell it if we're using scalable resolution, how many amplifiers we've got. And we do that with that little graphic you can see with the line array modules in different colors. And as you, you know, tap up and down, it colors speakers the same to easily show you where you're gonna wire them up. That's the first bit. The next thing we do is we need to weight our goal setting. So as I described at the beginning, we have these three goals non-leakage, audience area, hard avoid. Now the mathematics process needs to figure out how much effort it puts in each area. And so all of those bars that you can see, the red, green and blue, they add up to 100%. And as you increase the emphasis on one target, you decrease the emphasis on the other. And that's useful because there are applications, for example, Block 9 at Glastonbury, where nearly all the emphasis is on a hard avoid to stop the sound system uh, upsetting neighbors to two, 300 meters away from the site. Uh, and it's a rave, so out front, you want it to be you know, nice and loud at the front. Uh, the flip to that, and perhaps far more common, would be a pretty even split between the three, where it's trying to keep sound off the stage in, for example, a theater, and then still maintain a very consistent performance in the audience area. So four easy steps, chuck in your venue information, set the goals, click optimize for mechanics, click optimize for acoustics via the DSP. Uh, and then what we do is we move through that process. And at the end, we have the rigging information that we need and we have an exported DSP file that can be loaded either into MLA enclosures or in the example showed on the screen into the IK amplifiers for use with wavefront precision. So uh, that happens through a piece of software called ViewNet. ViewNet uh, loads in all of those FIR coefficients and then it does pretty much everything you would expect a modern piece of sound system control software to do, allows grouping, presets, gains, all of that kind of stuff, control of levels, EQs, delays, and becomes the hub of managing the sound system while the performance is going on. 
So James has touched on these already. Uh, our icon amplifiers uh, are used exclusively with our Wavefront Precision Series, and that's not only because of their power and their flexibility, but also the process of getting all of these FIR coefficients up into the loudspeaker hang. So each of those amplifiers, the IK42 with its four channels of 5K, or the IK81 with its eight channels uh, of 1250, uh, those amplifiers on every single output have 1000 taps of FIR filtering available to us. And that enables us to control the sound right down to 100 hertz with about a 10 millisecond delay uh, for full FIR processing, whilst also having all the features you'd ex expect from a modern amplifier, you know, incredibly lightweight, class D, uh, proven reliability, two AES inputs, analog inputs, Dante, and of course, control via ViewNet that I've already mentioned. So moving into the loudspeakers, uh, the first system that we use uh, scalable resolution with is O-Line, our micro line array. Uh, O-Line has been in our, our family for about a decade uh, and was initially you know, the birthplace of the idea of using mathematics to optimize the coverage of a sound system. Initially, purely with that mechanics optimization, but then last year uh, we introduced and added in scalable resolution uh, via our IK amplifiers to enable us to get the maximum performance from an O-line hang. The speaker itself is a funny little chap with its two uh, four inch or three and a half inch uh, low mid drivers uh, with their contour diaphragms. Uh, and then in the middle, those very tightly packed half inch uh, tweeters that are point of an inch apart to ensure vertically we get uh, uh, the tightest beam that we possibly can while still having something that uh, behaves as a line array element. In terms of uh, the little mids, you can see there they've got these strange uh, plastic or foam uh, uh, covers that go over the diaphragms and that's basically to match the shape of the waveguide so that even though they're very tightly packed in the middle, they don't interfere with the dispersion of the HF drivers, which enables them to have a nice high crossover point whilst maintaining very good horizontal pattern control and not interfering with the horizontal pattern control of the HF, which you can see in that beam width there. So this micro line array is for installation. There are an absolute myriad of examples of success installing O-Line over the years. And we do that with all of this, uh, uh, you, you know, iron mongery uh, uh, that allows us to have all of these versatile rigging options uh, and the like, and then to have them in a discreet way. So once it's all rigged, it looks very discreet uh, uh, and is very practical on an installation. Okay, so moving on from O-Line, uh, we need to go up to our passive line array offering, our passive optimized arrays, which are the Wavefront Precision Series, starting with the little guy, the WPM, uh, all the way up through the uh, uh, 8 and the 10, up to the big guy, the 12-inch, the WPL. We first brought uh, these two of these four products to market in 2017 uh, and immediately won awards uh, for the principles of taking that technology that we've harnessed over the years in an MLA system and really bringing that uh, uh, to a wider market, particularly in the installation sectors uh, where perhaps people don't want to install fully powered systems all the time. So moving into the speaker specs themselves, uh, here is a WPM, it's a dual six and a half inch uh, array, and you can see it deployed here on some pretty big arenas, given its tiny compact size. Moving into the specs of the loudspeaker itself, it's a 16 ohm dual six and a half inch line array module, and it's passive. So there's a passive crossover network inside there, meaning that one amplifier channel is required uh, only, uh, make it particularly flexible in the world of scalable resolution. The frequency response is 76, to 18 kilohertz and it has 100 degrees of horizontal dispersion and does 10 degrees in the vertical. In terms of max SBL, Robin already touched on this. Uh, we quote things with a 6 dB crest factor. It's become particularly popular with some of the European brands to quote a 12 dB crest factor. If you want to make a, a, a comparable uh, uh, comparison between those guys and us, you take our 130 dB, which we consider to be measurable, reasonable and representative, and you add the extra 6 dBs of marketing on top uh, and away you go. In terms of the uh, unit itself, it's about 14 K, so kilograms, so it's a pretty lightweight, compact unit. The HF drivers, are these three little 0.7 inch horn loaded compression drivers. 
a theme through all of our arrays is multiple small diaphragms handling HF. We do this, they move faster, they don't have the distortion characteristics of the great big two inch drivers that lazy designers plop in other arrays. Uh, and they also allow us to physically get the low mid sources close together. And again, as we move on to the low mid, you can again see we've contoured those right to the shape of the front of the waveguide. And we've done that um, partly, uh, uh, um, you know, because it's just the way it's done, but predominantly because what we've done is match the shape of the driver fronts to the waveguide. And that means that even as they're pistoning back and forwards, they're not interfering with the HF waveguide. And it also means that the entirety of the front of the loudspeaker is an HF waveguide. So you'll often see a couple of direct radiating little six and a half and a little horn in the middle from, from people who've, who've not designed arrays. We choose to use as much of the front of the enclosure as we possibly can to ensure that down at the kind of 2K-ish crossover point we have on that model, that we're getting the best horizontal pattern control that we can. So a uh, little bit on accessories. Uh, I'll just quietly uh, uh, not list the lot, but basically what you what is important to understand about Martin's line array offerings is that whether it be wavefront precision or MLA, we have tons of very, very flexible accessories to enable our customers to deploy these systems in a myriad of different examples, you know, electronics, rigging, the whole lot. You know, what are the things that we believe if you buy a sound system and it's going to become especially important over the coming months is flexibility in deployment is absolutely the key thing you know a small array like wpm does need to be able to be a collection of little speakers on a stick on a stage but at the same time you want to be able to hang 16 20 of them deep uh, and do a concert for five to ten thousand people and and therefore we have an absolute myriad of accessories available for all of this stuff to ensure that our customers get the most that they require out of the loudspeaker offering in terms of packaging, uh, we recommend packaging uh, uh, optimized arrays with these new cardioid subs. Uh, this is the SXC115. It's a 15 inch sub with a 12 inch sub in the back and you can see lots of different applications. Diving right into the specifications of it, it's got a 15 inch driver with a four inch voice coil uh, doing the, the lion's share of the business at the front. Uh, and then separately processed on a different DSP in a different amp channel is a 12 inch driver with a four inch voice coil in the rear. And together, those are processed to give a cardioid dispersion. What does that mean? Well, effectively, uh, when you are standing in front of the subwoofer, they are constructively adding together. And when you are standing behind the subwoofer, the two drivers are destructively acting together. And that, what that means is you get a little bit of benefit out the front. You get an extra dB or two out the front uh, of level than you would over a standard single 15 inch driver. But then you also get this 21 dec decibels of reduction relative to the front position behind it. And that's really important, especially when you're gonna mix it with a, an optimized line array, because optimized line arrays are so quiet behind them. And this really helps keep the level down on the stage. So uh, we're now gonna move up to WPS. Uh, uh, for those of you that have been to our open days, this would normally be the point uh, where we listen to the loudspeakers and uh, I'm, I'm sure that we'll all get to do that again. Uh, but anyway, moving on to WPS, that's the eight inch model, the next uh, guy up in the family. And we'll dive right into the specs. There's quite a lot going on in here. You know, when we looked at the eight inch array category, we felt that there was a lot of people, you know, just shoving a pair of eights either side of a little waveguide and putting a big old diaphragm compression driver in the middle. And we don't really like the sound of big diaphragm compression drivers in that kind of application. Uh, and we don't like, uh, uh, um, you know, low crossover points which we'll talk about a little bit more in a sec. And so we wanted to do something that was really true to our brand ethos uh, and had the crossover points we like and had excellent pattern control. So anyway, this unit's fully passive. So a three-way passive unit with a frequency response from 70 Hertz up to 1820K. Uh, and again, going up a size in line array module for us means going up about 3 dB in level. Uh, and so 133 dB a peak, and again, 100 in the horizontal and 10, 10 in the vertical, and that's 27 kilos in weight. So just moving on. Okay, so in inside the box, you'll find two 8-inch LF drivers, 
four four inch mid-range drivers and four one inch exit compression drivers all loaded onto this great big baffle which is providing a horn flare and some compression for each of them so if we have a quick look at the lf driver you can see this pair of neodymium eight inch drivers and they've got uh, uh, um, you know decent uh, motors firing their cones into the back of the waveguide what that actually is is a compression chamber that allows us to lift the upper end of its frequency response by getting some free sensitivity before porting the rear uh, uh, so that we get a decent amount of LF extension below them. And those run up to about 500 hertz. We come out of those into kind of the vocal mid-range drivers that in this case run up to about 2K. And you can see these tight little four inch drivers that are on phase bungs, again, to really ensure that we're getting a load of upper sensitivity out of that driver. Uh, and it's able to keep up with all these compression drivers. And you can see the distance between them is very, very narrow. And that enables us to get the crossover point, you know, a good octave higher than some of the competitors whilst maintaining this great horizontal pattern control. And then finally, we don't like big compression drivers. So here are our four little one inch polymer diaphragm Neo compression drivers coming at about 2K. And the way to think of these is we've got four little one inch diaphragms that together have an overall moving mass that's larger than a single compression driver because they're light and they're small they're going to move quickly and they're going to regenerate top end without breakup and that's a theme throughout all of our arrays as you'll see and again loads of accessories truck it pack it you know power it fly it for install ground stack it flying for touring all available from us on a real turnkey system approach And then again, we would recommend powering or partnering the uh, WPS arrays with our new new ish uh, SXC 118 cardioid subwoofer. Uh, diving into the specs, you've got a four inch voice coil, 18 inch driver in the front, and then you've got a 14 inch, three and a half inch voice coil in the rear. And those are independently processed to give us our cardioid dispersion and a very high output of 140 dB from something that has a pretty small footprint, particularly from the front. In terms of dispersion, uh, that looks a little bit like this. You get a little bit more benefit than you did with the 15 out front. So you get a couple of dB. Uh, and again, the same 21 dB of rejection at 63 hertz behind it. And you can see, again, when you compare that to the omnidirectional uh, SX118 standard subwoofer, why it's such a great partner for an optimized array. And then just recently launched, we also have the SXCF, where F stands for flying, and that enables us to uh, fly a bunch of these in a hang using uh, uh, the four point rigging system, and also to put a second bar underneath the subs and then transition through to a hang of WPS if you need a, a full, full range source up in the air. Moving up to 10 inch, uh, uh, again, this is WPC. A uh, couple of things here. We uh, have our 10 inch units and we're going to delve into the specs of the unit. We have a pair of low mid uh, 10s, a pair of fives and some tweeters. Uh, and this time it's three way bi amplified. So we need a little bit more headroom available for those 10 inch drivers. Uh, but we still keep with the idea of having a passive between the mid and high to make sure that we get a sensible amplifier count despite all of the uh, requirements for scalable resolution. And again, up in level, this time 135 dB uh, and managing 100 degrees in the horizontal by 10 in the vertical with a cabinet weight of 35 kilos. So sticking with the same principle as before, we like a much higher HF uh, crossover point than other people. So we have these tiny 0.7 inch drivers. And yes, they're smaller than the ones that we would use, for example, in WPS. But the reason for that is that we are not coming into that pass band until four and a half, five kilohertz. So they really are behaving like almost like a tweeter, um, less than, than a typical compression driver you might find in a competitive product. The reason we're able to do that is below them, we have these very bespoke custom five inch mid range drivers, uh, which are horn loaded with a phase bung in front. That phase bung brings the sensitivity of the upper mid up and really enables us to have that as a vocal driver. So you're handling all the frequencies from kind of 400 hertz all the way up to four kilohertz, meaning that there's one pass band uh, uh, covering my slightly hoarse voice this afternoon. And then below that, <clears throat> we have a pair of 10 inch drivers, uh, which are hybrid slot loaded. So the front of that driver fires into the side of the cabinet, 
that's actually a managed space and that provides some compression again lifting up its upper pass fan sensitivity and the rear of the driver is ported extending the LF down to ensure that the base comes out of the hang. And again, stack it, you know, truck it, power it, whatever you want to do. There's a whole turnkey package available for touring and install uh, from Martin Audio. And again, for us, this is all about flexibility of deployment. Could be ground stacked with three to four boxes, uh, um, you know, for small shows or hung 16, 18 deep for 15,000 people outside once we're allowed to do such things again. And really, although we see plenty of people, uh, particularly on the installation world, using SXC and SX218s with uh, WPC to really get the maximum punch out of that system, we'd always recommend our SXH218. You know, without going uh, uh, into too much detail, you don't get much more power and control out of a subwoofer than you do out of this beast. You know, here we've got 107 dB at one watt, one meter. Uh, and if you bridge an IK42 into it, which the big old four and a half inch voice coil, 18 inch drivers will happily take, this will produce a half space peak SPL of 148 dB, which is pretty pokey. And then finally, moving on to the WPL. Uh, WPL is the largest guy in the series. Is a dual 12 inch array and you can see here the first use of it in the UK last year deployed uh, famously on the Glastonbury Festival's new icon stage for block nine probably the biggest immersive rave that's ever happened with a six point sound system each with 12 of these boxes in <clears throat> excuse me managed by uh, a whole bunch of staff from Martin as well as the crew down there from RG Jones so a uh, great spectacle and ever since then the PA has been going from strength to strength, both in the UK and around the world. The speaker itself is three-way. We're sticking with biamps to maximize our flexibility on amplifiers. So there's a passive mid-high section, but with a very steep slope in between them, uh, uh, and it's all horn loaded. Uh, pretty punchy. You can see 139 dB uh, peak out the LF there, uh, and 90 degrees of horizontal coverage. And it's a pretty lightweight package at 64 kilos. So in terms of the LF drivers, you can see we've got a pair of 12 inch drivers, they're horn loaded. You can see them firing into the back of the cabinet, into the throat of the horn, then expanding around to the mouth to ensure we get the utmost sensitivity. And for the observant, you'll see that they're equally spaced on their exits either side of the cabinet. And that's so that they begin to beam in as we get in the uh, upper pass band to help give the box much, much better horizontal pattern control than perhaps you might expect from a couple of direct radiating drivers. They're also ported, you can see it next to the five inch, six and a half inch mid range and that extends the LF down. As we come out of those, we go into these two six and a half inch mid range drivers. Again, they're handling 250 Hertz up to about three and a half kilohertz. So they're handling <coughs> the whole of the vocal range. Excuse me two seconds. As Robin said, it gets a little hoarse. It's actually uh, it's surprisingly for April, it's 27 degrees, or May rather, it's 27 degrees here in the UK. So it's a little bit unusually warm for us and we don't have air conditioning. And then finally, one moves up to these uh, small diaphragm one inch exit compression drivers. Again, you know, most manufacturers at this point, big pair of boring old two inch drivers screaming away like a monitor wedge. We don't do that. We choose to have a higher crossover point, uh, massively reducing the amount of distortion in between uh, uh, in those diaphragms. And again, having those smaller diaphragms that can move much faster and regenerate high frequencies much, much better. All the accessories you'd expect. Uh, I particularly love these carts that we make, which have uh, you know got these arms on the side. You can stack weight on top of them in the truck, uh, um, but also they pack down to be really compact with those bars coming out when you fly the product straight out of the cart. Lots going on. Then finally, uh, you know, rounding up, we would recommend again that WPL is uh, married to our SXH218 subwoofer. Uh, and just recently, we've launched the flying variant of that, the SXHF, which now enables you to hang three of them above uh, the uh, WPL system by having a pair of fly bars using one as a transition grid. Equally, it has a four point rigging system. So if you want to turn around every third box, it's possible to hang a fully cardioid deployment as required. 
So in summary, uh, scalable resolution offers lots of flexibility to the installer, to the production company, to the event, et cetera, uh, to tailor and change the system requirements. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, we're very proud of their exceptional sonic performance, uh, and I really hope that quite soon we'll all get to enjoy those together. Okay, so moving on finally to MLA. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit in detail about MLA, but the whole family includes the MLA Mini, the MLA Compact, and then the MLA system. And this is the absolute uh, ultimate today in the optimization array offering from anybody on the planet. Uh, maximum hard avoid, improved consistency, and an entirely active self-powered system approach. In terms of MLA itself, uh, it appeared in our world uh, around 2010 but really began to make its way into the market across 2012 uh, and onwards. And, and today uh, is a multi-award winning sound system at multi-award winning events and festivals all over the globe. So how does it differ from wavefront precision? Well, this graphic shows it to you very, very simply. Every single transducer circuit in the array has its very own dedicated DSP. So offering the absolute maximum granularity that we're able to offer within the hang with the processing of each of those HF elements by their own DSP and amplifier. So uh, firstly, yeah, very similar acoustics to a WPL. It's the highest SPL multicellular array element. It's got a four point rigging system, very good horizontal pattern control, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, dedicated amps. And of course, as I've already said, it's a three way loudspeaker. There's also a dedicated down fill enclosure that has 20 degrees of uh, uh, vertical and is a little bit wider in the horizontal to avoid burning array elements down at the bottom of the hang. So uh, in terms of what's going on, there's an AES input, there's an analog input, runs down to 50 hertz, uh, 90 degrees in the horizontal and 10 in the vertical. A little bit heavier than WPL because we've got to put in that big rigging system, but more importantly, the electronics package into the back of the enclosure. And you can see the HF, which is always a good indicator of the ultimate PA output, is capable of 145 dB from those three one-inch compression drivers uh, we discussed earlier. So there they are, individual one inch exit compression drivers. Uh, they are uh, uh, processed individually. So, you know, very, very, very tight granularity, particularly in the near field of a, of a big PA, where we're able to get a step up in, in control. Uh, and then those run for again, from about three kilohertz up to about 20K. Now people comment on the fact that our mid high is asymmetrical uh, and wonder as to why we've chosen to take that approach. One of the things to understand with the FIR processing, processing available to us is you know, the crossover between these two uh, components is 196 dB per octave. There is a brick wall separating those mid-range and HF drivers interfering with each other. Similar approach to WPL, we then have these uh, mid drivers, again, 250 up to three and a half K, each individually processed this time uh, for the maximum amount of resolution. And then finally, the LF drivers, you can see same kind of principle as WPL, pair of 12s firing into horn with the rear volume ported and using a clever port technique to re, uh, reduce the amount of power compression and turbulence from that flared port. Uh, many of you will know this, uh, but certainly over here in the UK and several parts of the world, you know, MLA has established itself as the system for dealing with very large events where hi-fi quality audio is required, uh, but have off-site noise issues. That's a picture of Hyde Park. Uh, some who know me know that I must, I've worked on that gig on and off, uh, mostly without a Martin Audio hat on. And when I joined Martin Audio uh, and went to Hyde Park in the first year, the first thing that struck me was amongst all the changes they'd made was a change to Capital Sound and an MLA system. And, you know, really we were running, comfortably run 100, 99, 100, sometimes a little bit more throughout the whole day at a gig that traditionally was running at 95 or 96 and has 75 off, dB offsite uh, noise limits 200 meters away from the site. And that was all achieved partly because uh, of the harder void, but also because what you get with a conventional system is a conventional system is going to drop off like this, you know, 3 dB are doubling for distance, if you're lucky, up until the point it becomes a point source. What you're able to do with an MLA system 
is effectively use the optimization to hold the level flat in level across the audience area past the mix position into the delays. And that means that the front row and the mix engineer are both getting the same level, but it's still going to drop off in the same way once it becomes a point source when you get distance from it. And that enables us to get this uh, dramatic improvement in the level across the audience space. And uh, delighted that uh, Jim King there, the senior vice president of live events uh, for AEG is more than happy to give us a quote. Similarly, we spent a long time uh, and have a long relationship with the Killers. Killers have been a Martin Audio client since they started uh, touring in the noughties. And their current front of house engineer, Kenny, uh, is a big fan of MLA, uh, uh, and I'm delighted to say a, a, a friend of most of us at Martin Audio. Uh, and, you know, everywhere he goes in the room, he still says the PA sounds the same. He gets the same consistent result night after night. Uh, and MLA really has been the choice for that band now for a long time. So very quickly recapping, we've got the MLA Mini System and the MLA Compact similar to uh, the wavefront precision equivalents, but with a, a little bit more flexibility of amplifier count, and then up to the big MLA system that we've described. Maximum hard avoid, improve consistently, really a great modern PA. And then, you know, finally wrapping up for me, just a reminder of something that James said at the beginning, we really have this two-tiered product strategy where we have uh, uh, professional products uh, in our in introductory tier, and then really for those that require that extra edge, we move up to our, our premium professional offering, whether it be a tiny little speaker for a pub or a bar or a full-blown MLA system that you'll find at Worthy Farm this time next year.